The historical context of the Yangna is that it was one of the largest villages of the Tongva people. And on September 4, 1781, the Spanish governor Felipe de Neve founded Los Angeles, which was where it was near the site of the Indian village of Yangna. This was a favorite trading spot for the native people before it was colonized by the Spanish, which it is now the LA City Hall till this day. They were forced to leave and they did not have any rights because since they were they were native, they were not able to defend anything. Yang Nas, historical significance. The Yang Nas were the first to live in what is currently Elijah Park, Dodger Stadium, and where the Los Angeles Police Academy currently is. Political significance. Although the Yang Nas inhabited areas of present-day Los Angeles, it is the pobladores that are recognized as the first settling the land. It's interesting to note that the Yang Nas were on the land that the settlers recognized was valuable, as if it was suitable for plantations. The Yang Nas had a necessary resource, which should have given them power and thus recognition. However, because they lacked characteristics that the pobladores accepted and lacked the ability to speak Spanish, rather spoke their language of Shoshone, they were not given the rightful recognition. Social significance. When the Dodgers first came over from Brooklyn, they could have been renamed Yang Nas. However, this did not happen. It has a lot to do with the fact that few know they were the first to inhabit the land prior to other settlers. This has to do with the political issue of lacking power, thus lacking the ability to have their story known. Cultural significance. For many, baseball is more than just a sport, but rather a symbol of patriotism. The fact that the Dodgers didn't change their name suggests that because the Yang Nas are not seen as a symbol of patriotis patriotism, the name was not embraced. At the time of the formation of the city of Los Angeles, Yang Na was a village of the Tongva tribe, what is now the intersection of Alameda and Commercial Street, south of the 101. In the 19th century, Yang Na would provide the Spanish colonists with resources such as seafood, fish, bowls, pouts, and baskets. The Indians were often treated badly as their cultures knew little or no violence, making them placid by nature. In Manu Vimlaseri's article, Fugitive Decolonization, he focuses on what to the fugitive is decolonization. To the fugitive, decolonization was a state of complete emancipation and liberation from outside forces. However, through U.S. property claim, black people were removed to spaces of slavery and native peoples were removed to spaces of confinement and disappearance. Removals from and removals to removals in opposite directions incentated U.S. sovereignty claims over the land and life, which resembles what Spanish colonists did to the Tongva people by inhabiting their land, they essentially own the people too. This being the first location, I wasn't too sure what to expect. It is present-day LA City Hall, but from a historical point of view, this is where the Yang Na Indian tribe first settled. Without looking this up, I'm pretty sure not many people would have known that. None of their land has been preserved, and the city just keeps making buildings and structures all over their cultural history. Smith's reading on the three pillars of white supremacy on page 68 says... A second pillar of white supremacy is the logic of genocide. This logic holds that indigenous people must disappear. In fact, they must always be disappearing in order to allow non-indigenous people's right full claim over this land. This is pretty much what was going on here. Nobody really knows that the Indian tribe had first settled there because of everything that was going on. And then what is your way to forget about someone then by building over their land? Yang Na LA Town Hall. LA Town Hall used to be the home of the Yang Na Indians until settlers from Mexico and Spaniards took over. In Boyain's film, Even the Rain, it is very well captured how Spaniards took over America. The natives were mostly friendly and brought them gifts. However, as they began to settle, they also began to build their churches, enslaved the natives, and took over their resources. It is now known that the Yang Nas only exist in old written records. The Los Angeles Town Hall, which is a place of congregation for the people of Los Angeles is built upon Native American ground, yet is only considered a colonial building. 
Crosby implores us to reassess the initial encounter. Instead of seeing a simple building in Los Angeles, we should be recognizing it as the original site of the Yang Na. The less we speak of the original owners of this land, the more we reinforce a narrative of acceptance towards the encounter. When reading the information article on LA City Hall, you notice that the Yangna are not really mentioned at the beginning because the original story is that 44 settlers from Mexico first founded LA in 1781. But that is not true. The Yangna used to inhabit, the, inhabit that area before those settlers came to Mexico and tried to convert all those people to their religion. This is one of the many ways whites have manipulated history to wipe out certain groups of people from history. In this example, the Yangna. Many LA citizens, if asked if they know who the Yangna are, probably would be clueless as to who they are and that they were the first people in what is now to inhabit what is now known to be Los Angeles. This is another example of how certain events in history are omitted and altered. The Yang Na village has not had any real inclusion in the identity of LA, although it has sufficient merit and reason for it to have such representation. As Leon Fergatch explains in his LA Times article, Batting First for the Yang Nas, Southern California is largely believed to have been discovered and settled upon by Mexican ranchers. The truth is that when Mexican settlers made their way to present day LA, the Yang Na village was already there and witnessed the foreigner the foreigners as they stopped on their land for the first time in 1781. Not only has Southern California seemed to have forgotten a fundamental piece of their history, but the area has even adopted pieces of culture from places entirely disconnected from the state. Fergatch explains that the LA Dodgers name comes from the past Brooklyn team, where baseball fans on the East Coast had to dodge trolley cars in order to reach the stadium. The Dodgers title actually has no connection to LA at all. While suggestions like the LA Young Nas would make for an appropriate and authentic team name, the difficult thing is that not many baseball fans or city residents for that matter know about the original people of LA and their significance in history. According to the Yangna site, it challenges a myth of a nation of immigrants because the Tongva people were not really free from slavery. They were actually auctioned and were being sold to their slave owners and the main important thing about this is that the people from today are trying to cover all that history and it challenges the myth i mean the linear it challenges the concept of linear because uh it's not really a linear process it's actually a cyclical process because everything go comes back up from the past you're reliving it again all over again and the fact that we know what happened to the slave on this these slave people tells us that it wasn't linear because it wasn't forgotten it's actually reliving and happening all over again this site relates to in the light of reverence because in the light of reverence uh there was a freedom of act passed to the Indians and it wasn't respected because, because their sacred places were still being taken away from them and they were losing them. The historical context of the Downey block of downtown LA is that many Indians were auctioned off after they were being imprisoned for many crimes that they did. For example, um, throwing away trash or committing simple little crimes they were auctioned and the ones who paid more for them they were taken to them and they had to work for them regardless of what they had to do for example it was it was said back then that when the city has no work um the indians were just present and they couldn't do anything until they actually had to work downy block Downey Block Historical Significance On Downey Block, protests were held to prevent the ending of casino-style games on Indian reservations, as well as where Indians were gathered like cattle and auctioned to the highest bidder and work a week for free. Political Significance The California Act allowed any white man to pay the bail of an Indian and have the Indian work for that man for free. The LA City Council passed an ordinance that allowed prisoners to be auctioned off for private service, which took place for nearly 20 years. 
Social significance. Nine out of 10 natives were wiped out. This was even more seen once the gold rush happened, when the numbers went down even more. They were used as cheap labor and later into indentured servitude. They eventually were paid in alcohol, which they ended up getting drunk, thus resulting in them going to jail, which then resulted in their boss paying their bill, which demanded a week of free labor. Culture significance. There were, in the eyes of the white man, two types of Indians, wild and the Christianized or the tamed slash mission Indians. This was a form of thinly disguised slavery by the white man. It was so normal that there was a letter found in which it demonstrates that transactions involving the purchase of natives occurred as a common practice and was a Com casual, common conversation among people. Downy Block Downy Block was used to auction Native Indians after being locked up for being intoxicated in public and other quote-unquote crimes. In this place, whites would pay the bails of the Natives to take them out of jail, and in exchange, they would have them work for them until the bail was discharged. Smith talks about how white supremacy consists of three pillars in which one of them is slavery. This shows that whites took advantage of natives by incarcerating them first and then sold them to be used as slaves. The second site here is Downey Block, which is up the street from the previous location, which is LA City Hall. Looking at it, it doesn't seem like there would be any significant history here. But after some research, you'll find that indigenous Indians were sold here. And relating this to the coursework, we see that history does repeat itself. Starting back in the 16th century, Africans were captured, sold, and shipped off to do labor for someone else. Same concept here, but with indigenous Indians from LA. Reading a quote from Even the Rain, this subplot focuses on the apparently minor character of Maria, a filmmaker whose task is to shoot a making of documentary about the historic Columbus drama. However, Maria soon reveals herself to be more perspective perceptive than Sebastian and Costa feeling an instinctive em empathy towards the exploited Bolivians. A part of the film from Even the Rain reminds me of this location because Maria, one of the characters of the film, films a lot of what is going on in Bolivia and believes they should make their documentation on that while the other two characters don't really find interest in it and want to continue with their movie. And I feel that concept has a strong correlation with this location just because nowhere before this was I told that Indian slaves were sold here in Los Angeles. It's just, and I feel it's just as important part of history as anything else that we have learned, but it always tends to get left out. Downey Block. Downey Block was used to auction native Indians after being locked up for being intoxicated in public and other quote-unquote crimes. In this place, whites would pay the bills of the natives to take them out of jail, and in exchange, they would have them work for them until the bail was discharged. Smith talks about how white supremacy consists of three pillars in which one of them is slavery. This shows that whites took advantage of natives by incarcerating them first and then sold them to be used as slaves. From Town Hall, the Yangna would then go to Downey Block, which is exactly kind of like the uh, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet article by Dennis Childs, which was talking about the uh, chain gangs of the Middle Passage um, and from America, but uh, this was not really Middle America. Um, but from Town Hall, the Yangna were taken here and auctioned or imprisoned, so no matter what, they had a uh, harsh outcome. And having lost their freedom to be sold or imprisoned also prevents them from having mobility in any way, just kind of like the uh, slaves in the Middle Passage on the ships, uh, where they had absolutely no way to move or nowhere to go. Downey Block is where many Indians were auctioned off to work for local farmers. But the reason behind this is that these people were auctioned off because Indians were paid in alcohol and became drunk and were arrested. After they were auctioned in Downey Block, where local farmers posted their bill for weeks worth of work, these human auctions were 100% legal. 
This can be compared to the modern day prison system where prisoners are paid penny on on the dollar for the work. This is an example that not only were blacks the only people enslaved in the United States, so were Indians. Downey Block conflicts with a lot of Southern California perceptions. LA is commonly known to be the home of many minorities, including Latinos, African Americans, and Asians. Although diverse, it also it is also commonly considered for most of these minority groups to be subject to poverty and inequality. Oftentimes, these groups are considered to have undergone relatively similar levels of abuse or control by the Anglo American. This, however, is not entirely the case. As Robert Peterson explains in his podcast, The Hidden History of L.A., the Native Indians went through unique acts of injustice that were not experienced by other minority groups. The Downey Block, specifically, was an auction center where Indians were sold to Anglos and Mexican ranchers. Southern California is not typically known for its involvement in slavery. However, many Indians were subject to systems of forced servitude parallel to how some prisons work today. What is even less known is that Mexicans were also involved in the native Indian market and use them for their own benefits. As a side note, it is interesting to note that although Mexican settlers joined Anglos in this act, the Mexican population back then and in the present has continued to be subject to inequality in many ways. This supports an idea studied in class that explains that other groups such as the Cherokees tried to assimilate to Western society only to continue to be seen as inferior by white Americans. The next site we visited was the Downey Block, and it challenges the myth of a nation of immigrants because, again, the, Im the immigrants were not free from slavery. Uh, because here, during the 1850s and 1860s, the Native people were imprisoned for crimes such as vagrancy or loitering and were auctioned off, and they had to obey the Anglo and Mexican ranchers and do as they were told. The Downey Block site is not linear because it's talking about uh the time period back in the day such as the 1850s and 1860s so if it was linear it would be the past and would not be brought back up into the present right now therefore it is cyclical because it's going in a circle and the past is not forgotten it's still continuing up up until this day this site relates to uh, in the light of the reverence because uh, these slave people were being mistreated unfairly and were not giving the rights that they deserved. So basically it goes back to the beginning which is the myth of a nation of immigrants because it wasn't really considered a nation of immigrants. They were being treated as slave owners and were not treated as other individuals and as free human beings. Um, the historical context of the San Gabriel mission is that the natives actually assisted in helping construct the building and especially the village. The Indians themselves were, were doing this because they had caused an outrage on the soldiers and since they were in charge of this, the Tongma people were forced to perform manufacturing, um, different things, agriculture, and they actually had this place with food too. This was a native population. It was larger than anywhere else, but the villages were hostile to one another. So for example, the ones that were close to the, to the mission could not do anything else because that was their spot to be. It also provided different supplies to other missions as they started growing. And even the, and the natives, they were also threatened, but the San Gabriel mission began to have many more lives and as you can see up to right now, there are many there are many gardens and especially the museum and the cemetery itself, which demonstrate how many people from the past were there and they died due to all of this going on. San Gabriel Mission. Historical significance. The St. Gabriel Mission was established in 1771 and its establishment changed the lives of those surrounding. Part of the history involving the mission is that of Toy Perina, who took part in a revolt that occurred on October 25th, 1785. In later years, the Gabrielino Tavunga tribe, among with others, were affected by the lack of upholding the Treaty of Guadalupe, 
which required the U.S. to protect the natives. Political Significance Even when injustices were committed by the missions or others in the surroundings, the government failed to intervene, which is why there were community-led revolts, such as that Toyperina was involved in. Even more appalling, the U.S. chose to ignore the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe. This was especially seen when the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the 18 treaties, later known as the 18 Lost Treaties, which set aside land for the natives. The U.S. involvement goes all the way to the Supreme Court, who, although who had good intentions, didn't do justice for what occurred with the land stripped for the natives. To make matters worse, the Tavunga tribe isn't recognized federally, only in the state of California, which means not only was their land stripped, but they aren't even recognized as a community. Social Significance The treatment of the natives led people like Nicholas Jose to lead a rebellion against the missions, especially when he lost his loved ones and was prohibited by the missionaries to perform traditional dances, some meant to honor the deceased. We can see the lack of importance given to the natives and their beliefs by the fact that interest groups and their want for money is what stopped the government from giving land to to the indigenous community. Cultural significance. The mission caused tension amongst the tribes by pitting them against each other. The staff of the mission gathered with the Tavunga tribe to create a play in honor of Toypurina, who led, participated in one of the rebellions led by the community. The courts too felt that they needed to right the wrongs done to the natives on more than one occasion, because even when trying to right the wrong, they still managed to wrong the natives. This shows that the U.S. only acts when trying to mend what it has done rather than avoid doing wrong in the first place. San Gabriel Mission The San Gabriel Mission, which now serves as a Catholic church and cemetery, was a place where 6,000 indigenous people died. Even though it is hard to imagine the way in which they lived during the Spanish rule, it is also almost impossible to not think of these people wanting to leave and be free. Lindsay and Johnson in Searching for Climax give us an insight into the worlds and minds of enslaved people, such as their sexuality and the way they may have or have not used it to protect themselves. The third location on the store was the San Gabriel Mission. Two things came to mind when arriving here. First was I've been here before as a kid, and two was how close it was to home. I've already had some previous knowledge of the place from learning about the missions in in previous grades. And after doing some of my own research, I came out to find that the mission had used indigenous Indians as slaves, most of which would be bought at the previous location, Downey Block. And to add to that, over 6,000 Indians had died here, nothing that was ever taught in previous grades. But relating this to the class, we see two pillars of white supremacy here, genocide and slavery. Slavery, easier to see that the church was holding them as slaves. Then genocide may be a little harder to see, but what the church is doing here is a form of genocide by using one specific group to enslave and eventually end up with a huge amount, a large number of them dying off. And I'm reading a quote from Smith's paper on page 67. One pillar of white supremacy is the logic of slavery. The writers note this logic renders black people as inheritably slavable as nothing more than property. That is, in this logic of white supremacy, blackness becomes equated with slavability. The form of slavery may change, but the logic itself has remained consistent. And Smith is correct here, just replacing blacks with Indians, and we have pretty much the same thing. San Gabriel Mission The San Gabriel Mission, which now serves as a Catholic church and cemetery, was a place where 6,000 indigenous people died. Even though it is hard to imagine the way in which they lived during the Spanish rule, it is also almost impossible to not think of these people wanting to leave and be free. Lindsay and Johnson in Searching for Climax give us an insight into the worlds and minds of enslaved people, such as their sexuality and the way they may have or have not used it to protect themselves from unjust punishments. This is a history that is almost never mentioned in the textbooks. So I didn't really know much about the dark past of missions until taking this class because most of the time our uh, high schools and middle schools would tell us how wonderful missions were and how they helped people out, but um, the religious... 
undertones of forcing somebody to change their belief system to save them is pretty shocking. Um, And that kind of reminds me of uh, Bartolome de las Casas, which is the short account of destruction in the Indies. Um, So people were either forced to convert or murdered. And uh, Costas accounts of the need and desire to convert at cost of millions of lives in the Indies, similar to that of the Tongva, which were moved to the San Gabriel mission. Um, and the, mis- the missionaries received free labor in exchange for absolutely nothing because the Native Americans received enslavement. The San Gabriel mission is a beautiful religious site, but many people do not know that it was built by Indian slave labor. If we compare the size of the missions in other religious sites in the U.S., we notice that the San Gabriel Mission is pretty small. And this site can be compared to when Columbus came to the Americas. The missionaries indeed came to the Americas to try to convert the Indians to their religion, but in the end, the greed of the Spaniards took over. In this example, the Tongva people were enslaved and used to build their mission. The San Gabriel Mission serves as a great example of the often left out details of Catholic missionaries and the tactics they used. Southern California is known for its many churches and they are often admired for their architecture and spiritual significance. It is not talked about as much, however, that many of these churches were made possible only through the control and manipulation of Native Indians. As the online article, Tribal History, Lost Treaty Rights and Current Status, from the website GabrielinoTribe.org explains, Many natives were introduced to the church and its teachings. These Indians were forced to leave their traditional beliefs and practices behind and adopt the customs of the Spanish missionaries. Otherwise, they would face acts of torture, discrimination, or death. Not only were they forced to join the church, but they were also used to construct and provide materials for the San Gabriel Church, just like with many other church locations. With this in mind, it should be encouraged to see California churches not only as a proclamation of faith, but as a source of pressured assimilation as well. The next site we visited was the San Gabriel Mission, and it challenges the myth of a nation of immigrants because all of the Tongva peoples were lured to this place with food and were converted to Catholicism. Uh, They were were, uh, forced to perform agricultural and some manufacturing work, which is not right because they were also they were being treated as slave slave people because they weren't free to do what they wanted and they had to do as they were told and they had to obey so at the end of the day they are considered slaves still at this site 6000 indigenous people also died here during the spanish rule and there was two people which was Topirina and Nicolas Jose who tried to make a change for themselves and they were unsuccessful. This occurred in 1775. This site uh, challenges the concept of linear because we are being told about the past and the ways that these indigenous people try to make a change for themselves and today things are different. Uh, People aren't really treated as slaves like they were back then but it is cyclical because it is repeating. The past is coming back to the present and it all it's all going in circles. This side uh, relates to the movie Even the Rain because in both in the movie and in this site, the in the people were the slaves were given food. They were treated like with more respect compared to other sites. They weren't treated that bad when compared to other places. Although they also had to do as they were told, and they were being in a way they were being lied to because although they had more advantages, at the end of the day they had to do what their owners told them to do. In the movie, the producers told the actors uh, what to do and how they were being treated. And in the site, they were forced into Catholicism without their consent. The historical context of the Indian Revival Center is that, for example, in the 1950s, they had programs of relocation. This means 
that the children were taken to high schools that that worship the American government and their people because they did not want them to go for their native for their native language and their native traditions and they try to make them forget them. For the parents themselves, they were also taken away from them and they were forced to focus their things. Indian Revival Center, historical significance. During the Indian relocation movement, many natives were placed in seven major cities. This was meant to get them to assimilate and more than anything, get a hold of their resources. Political significance. Through the relocation program, the government was supposed to give fundings such as stipends, housing, and jobs, but failed to provide any. Rather, they managed to distance themselves from the natives and step back from any responsibilities owed to the natives. Social significance. Even though the relocation program took place, many young members of the community took what happened as an opportunity to get an education and develop talents to help out their native community. This shows that despite the efforts, there have been resistance, such as through the AICC, the American Indian Community Council, which provide resources to help members of the community. Cultural Significance there continue to be events, such as powwows, where natives are able to celebrate and partake in cultural practices, such as dancing, singing, and drumming. They have used the resources they have to continue their practices, despite the government's attempt to stop them. The Indian Revival Center can be used as an example to prove the three pillars of white supremacy. One of the pillars, genocide and colonialism. Yes, this is a center that helps some indigenous slash Indian people, but the true purpose of this center was to relocate Indians. The government established it during the urbanization and relocation of the 1950s. History repeats itself. The American government takes Indian land and gives them another piece of land, way smaller, to make up for the land they took, in this instance, the Indian Revival Center. This is just another way Americans take the fourth location on this tour was the Indian Revival Center, a small building off Gage and Specht Avenue in Bell Gardens. Seeing its area and corner location, I can see why this building is easily overlooked by many. After doing some research, I found out that by 1960, LA had one of the largest Indian populations in the U.S. And six years later, the total population doubled to... Just over 25,000, with third being American Indians. Most of this had to do with the government's Urban Relocation Act in the 1950s. After being relocated, many Indians used a number of social institutions to keep their identity, one of which being the church. In this case, the church wasn't just seen as a place for religious services, but also for the revival of Indians. Relating this to the course we see again, the transfer of Indians from one location to another. Also rever referring to the documentary in the light of reverence, we see Indians still following their beliefs and keeping their hopes up even after the struggles the government has given them over their land. Indian Revival Center the Indian Revival Center is a church that was founded in 1956 where Tongva tribes gathered, and the documentary In the Light of Reverence demonstrates how colonialism destroyed and took over the land where indigenous people lived and practiced their ceremonies. This church, just like the very few locations, are just reminders of those cultures that are sadly no longer alive or close to being extinguished. So again, at the uh, Indian Revival Center, I'm going to be quoting or going to be referencing Alfred Cro uh, Crosby with the uh, reassessing 1492. Um, this Indian Revival Center is a place to uh, help and aid Native Americans in uh, restoring their faith. And they also donate and they're a big part of the community. And uh, Crosby reminds us that we need to reframe how the United States deals with this history while the Revival Center takes that history and brings it right to the forefront and making sure that it is not silenced. The Indian Revival Center 
can we use an example to prove three pillars of white supremacy? One of the pillars, genocide and colonialism. Yes, this is a center that helps some indigenous slash Indian people, but the true purpose of this center was to relocate Indians. The government established it during the urbanization and relocation of the 1950s. History repeats itself. The American government takes Indian land and gives them another piece of land, way smaller, to make up for the land they took, in this instance, the Indian Revival Center. This is just another way Americans tend to amend their actions in the past. The Indian Revival Center is different from the previous locations in that it does not hide what once was, but rather revives and keeps alive the Native American culture that has gone unnoticed by much of Southern California. LA and the whole of SoCal, for that matter, is not typically believed to be a home for Native Americans. Their cultural footprints in the region are not like those of Hispanic or African American communities. In fact, they are on the verge of non-existence. The Revival Center is a beacon of perseverance for the Native Americans of Bell Gardens. Vicky Ortiz explains in her KCET article, 1980s Powwows and Cultural Persistence, that the center has enabled a strong community of Native Americans to keep in touch with their roots. An example of this are the powwows that the people get, in, uh, get involved with, including children, during holiday celebrations. The article also mentions that there is actually a good size of Natives in the city who engage in business. The American Indian Community Council has even established services for the Native community, such as meetings aimed at getting the youth involved in leadership roles. The AICC has even provided networking events in LA. The effects of these programs are yet to be seen, considering Native representation in the area continues to appear low. However, it is centers like these that reminds everyone that past struggles and efforts to overcome them are alive in current times as well. The next site we visited was the Indian Revival Center and it is a church and a hub of political activity that formed during the federal government's urbanization and relocation programs of the 1950s. This site challenges the myth of a nation of immigrants because these native Indians were being stripped from their cultures and were and they were being taken away from what they believed their culture was. So because of this, they had no freedom to, to freely express their traditions. This site also cha challenges the concept of linear because, because Los Angeles is still considered a Tongva land. Dozens of tribal nations uh, remain here and have lived here for generations. This site also relates to the movie in the light of rever reverence because the Hopi tried to keep, for example, their sacred rock clean in order to practice their rituals, but yet others tried to take that from them and thought that it was a natural resource that's something, not something important. So like I said in the beginning, in the Indian Revival Center, uh, many of these native Indians were ripped away from their cultural beliefs. historical context of the American Indian movement was that in those offices where was where they had occupations of for example land that was fertile that was abandoned they did protests against the government and their own fairness to them they also resisted state violence for example there are proofs that demonstrate how many even had to go under demands and they the FBI had to keep tabs on them in order for them to not keep doing it but yet the Indians they try to fight for their rights and they try to take over because it was not fair how the federal enforcement was trying to close them in and not let them actually enjoy their American movement but yet the federal government could do anything that they pleased even though the Native Americans had a right to be there and the Tugna people that was their right because Los Angeles is basically their land and where they grew up at. American Indian Movement Historical Significance Wounded Knee was a month-long standoff between the American Indian Movement activists and local and federal law enforcement. This was a response to corruption in government that affected the natives. Political Significance The Lakota filed a suit against the U.S. to reclaim the Black Hills, which brought tension with corrupt official Richard Wilson.
who hated the natives. Such tensions brought forth the violence in the reservations, which the government failed to intervene and put an end to. Russell Means, a member of the activist group, was arrested and sent on bail conditionally. He had to provide a itinerary of his whereabouts 24-7, and if it did not match, he would be arrested. After many injuries and deaths, and Means behind bars, tribal elders stopped the revolt which led to an armistice between both parties. Social Significance Means used his bail as an opportunity to travel and educate the community in what happened at Wounded Knee. Above all, it was a means to unite and incite a want to fight the injustices committed and recruit funds and gather support for the movement. Cultural Significance What happened to Means is a constant reminder of the injustices and lack of action from the U.S. government. The FBI involvement in preventing the success of Wounded Knee rather than trying to combat the issues behind the revolt show the lack of interest the government had in fulfilling its duty to serve the public. American Indian Movement was created by indigenous people who tried to reclaim their sacred lands from the U.S. government. Just like in Even the Rain, we see the unjust ways in which government takes land and resources to their advantages, even if that means taking from the people. These movements show a unification of the community, tired of being oppressed by these white supremacists and unjust power. Our fifth location was at 4304 Clara Street, which is where the offices from the American Indian Movement were originally. From reading the tour guide, I knew it was going to be an apartment complex, but it was pretty awkward walking up to the place since, like I said, it's an apartment complex now. People living there and a huge group of us just walking through looking around. Relating this to the coursework. Not the building itself, but the history behind it resembles a lot of what we saw in Even the Rain, where the indigenous people were fighting for things they really shouldn't need to be fighting for in the first place, where in Even the Rain they're fighting to have affordable water, while Indians, for the most part, were fighting to keep their land. And in the documentary of In the Light of Reverence, we still see tribes continuing their traditions and gathering and fighting to keep what was theirs, essentially, in the first place. American Indian Movement was created by indigenous people who tried to reclaim their sacred lands from the U.S. government. Just like in Even the Rain, we see the unjust ways in which government takes land and resources to their advantages, even if that means taking from the people. These movements show a unification of the community, tired of being oppressed by these white supremacists and unjust power. So we really weren't sure where to go for the Native American or the American Indian movement. Um, we did go to the office, but it is now just an apartment complex. Um, but this site reminded me of Christopher McLeod's In the Light of Reverence, the documentary. Um, so the Native American, the American Indian movement gives a voice to the millions of lives affected by the encounter. And in the film, tribes fight against the infringement upon their land, something that could be aided by the American Indian movement. One voice is hard to hear, but many voices can create a true movement. History repeats itself one way or another. The American Indian movement can be compared to the film, Even the Rain where a revolt is started when the indigenous people are being rejected water access due to the, their inability to pay the new price that is almost three times what it was before. The, peop the indigenous people started a revolt just as the AMI did, but in this instance, the FBI kept close tabs on the AMI before the incident of Wounded Knee occurred. It can be argued that the American government finds a way or reason to reduce the amount of indigenous or Indian people in the U.S. In the incident of Wounded Knee, the Indians possessed low caliber older weapons when the forces that tried to suppress the revolt had more than 130,000 rounds just to suppress several Indians revolting. The old offices of the American Indian Movement are located at a present-day apartment complex. 
This is where operations and protests were planned by Native leaders looking to fight for justice against abusive government intervention a couple of decades ago. In its current form, the place looks like an ordinary but low-quality apartment with people relaxing on their patios. The complex as a whole seems to have many residencies tightly packed together. These type of apartments are everywhere in Southern California. However, just by looking at the Clara Saint, at the Clara Street location, you cannot tell that such an organization existed there. It seems like these offices have been buried in history, which makes you wonder what other common locations have deeper historic meaning than what is on the surface, especially pertaining to the forgotten trace of Native American life. Another site we visited was the American Indian Movement, and this site challenges the myth of a nation of immigrants because this was a house where the native, where the um, Tongva people uh, planned their protest against governmental injustices and resistance to state violence. And it challenges the myth of a nation of immigrants because because even though the Tongva people tried to keep their land, they were unsuccessful. Because at the end, the federal government still took their land today, and I know it is recognized today of all their hard work and what they tried to accomplish, but at the end of the day, they were unsuccessful. So again, it challenges the nation of immigrants because they weren't able to get their freedom and what they deserved. This site is cyclical rather than linear because we still know about this today, such as it's a historical event that it's, con that it's still known today, so it didn't stay in the past. People know about what happened and their accomplishments and all their hard work, so the past keeps coming back to the present rather than it being linear where the past stays in the past and the present is in the present. This site relates to in the, the movie In the Light of Reverence because in the movie, the Indians were selling water that belonged to them, but at the end of the day, they were being, they were taken advantage of because of their kind gestures. They were still treated unfa unfairly. And at this site, the, the Tongva people, although they use these houses to make their protests, they were still taken away from them and because they were unsuccessful. The historical context of the Pavangna, which is in Cal State Long Beach, is that this was actually and still is a very sacred place because that is a place where they would instruct and they had a burial ground. For example, um, a very important god, which was the legend of the Chingishnish, was actually born there and even though many people actually were doubting if he was a historical figure, he actually was because of his beliefs and the traditions that they have there. For example, being here and actually seeing the place does show a way where they would do in the campus their spiritual grounds and it just felt a different, it gave us a different vibe because it was where they would do a consistent ancient, ancient burial, meaning that this is where they marked their, their territory and they designated their historic their historic grounds and they actually had a religious significance because to them this was very important and keeping their traditions alive was what let them keep the land sacred and even though they had conflicts they still defended their rights and they did not plan of they did not plan of getting rid of this Pavungna historical significance Cal State Long Beach is the birthplace of the Gabrielino Tabungas Chigingish deity, although it's not sure if it is an actual historic figure or deity for the Tavungas, according to archaeologists and anthropologists. Political significance. The site where skeletal remains were found was placed on the historical sites list, although many want to reject that there was a Tavunga village in the area of discovery. Social significance. The school at one point took advantage of the discovery and used it in promotional material for the school, which demonstrates how the natives continue to be used for personal gain of others. Cultural significance. The land has been preserved as a sacred ground, although there have been attempts to build lucrative establishments in the area.
It is clear to see that although the land is sacred to the natives, there have been claims made arguing that the Tavunga didn't inhabit the land, nor that it should be kept sacred. Pavunga. Pavunga is an example of indigenous territory that is now owned by the government. In the Miles Reading removal, we see the way in which thousands of indigenous tribes were forced out of their home to gain access to their lands. Now these lands are being studied and their remains are found, just like the horrid stories that were buried along with them. The last location on this tour is Pavagna, which is located on the campus of Cal State Long Beach, right off Beach Drive and Bellflower Boulevard. After pulling into the first lot, I wasn't too sure if we were at the right location, but upon further inspection and walking out to the field, you notice rocks in different formations and ribbons tied to the trees. Also, initially, it does just look like an open field, and it's easy to see why someone with no care to history would want to use the space for an extra lot or anything they'd want to do with it. Relating to this to the course, we see here again Indian history being destroyed and erased. Back when Indians were set on their Trail of Tears, due to the Indian Removal Act, they were left, or they left their lands, homes, and belongings, anything they couldn't take with them, were ransacked, trashed, and destroyed. Essentially, what could have happened here, on probably a not so violent level, but still destroying the tribe's history. Reading a quote from Crosby's reading on page six sixty six. The driving force of the post-1492 changes happened not to be continental drift, nor the advanced and retreat of glaciers, nor the impact of comets, but only the actions of one species, Homo sapiens. But the actual result is much the same extinction and vast changes in the distribution of life forms. In time providing, we have... Time, there will be new species, descendants, and a matter of speaking of Christopher Columbus. And Crosby was right here. Indian tribes are not around how they used to be. I mean, there may still be tribes here and there, but the number is nowhere near what it was before English settlers arrived this far west. Pavanga. Pavanga is an example of indigenous territory that is now owned by the government. In the Miles Reading removal, we see the way in which thousands of indigenous tribes were forced out of their home to gain access to their lands. Now these lands are being studied and their remains are found, just like the horrid stories that were buried along with them. Our last stop in the tour was uh, Cal State Long Beach. And uh, again, it reminded me of In the Light of Reverence. So this spot was a... Um, important Native American ground for burial and for uh, uh, the birthplace of a god. And many students have protested um, the school attempting to sell the land in order to develop it. So um, it is the birthplace of a god in a burial ground. And had this been some type of Christian monument, you know, nobody would have a problem. But just like those in the film, narratives, narratives of this is mine and not yours pervades this space with non-natives claiming a right that does not exist. Puvunga, a religious site in the city of Long Beach located near the Cal State Long Beach campus. There are religious sites out there that many people do not know about. It could be a rock, a mountain, a nearby waterfall, or even something small as a piece of rock near a tree. But for many, those religious places are not seen as so just because they do not have an actual physical building. Due to this, many governments and or corporations want to tear these sites down to exploit the land or build something on top of it. This is a prime example of how the government sees indigenous people as unimportant and ignores their religion and what they consider religious sites. We need to remember that we were not the first people to inhabit this land and we should show some level of respect for them and their values and we should not mess with their historical sites and or religious sites.
The discovery of Pavunga reminds us of the footprints the Tongva village left behind. BJ Delas Armas explains in his article, Brief History of Pavunga, Cal State Long Beach is a Holy Land, that its connection to the divine figure, Chingish Nish, further supports the reality that Southern California is an inseparable home to Native Americans. Not only did they originate on this land, but they also have spiritual and divine ties to the region as well. The bond Native Americans hold to Southern California is often overlooked by a lot of Southern California itself. Attempts at building over this land, both before and after it was deemed a historic location, shows just how unfamiliar and disconnected many people are with the history of the Tongva and other Native American nations. The last and final site we visited was the Pavanga site, and this uh, this site was once a Tongva village, a very important one, of course, for it was uh, it was the birthplace of their god. Um, his the god's name was Chungishnish. It was that was where he gave birth. Not only that, but today has also been an important site of student and community activism protests protests that are done repeatedly there. This side challenges the myth of a nation of immigrants because this was once the Tongva people's lands and apparently it was taken from them because today Cal State Long Beach is placed there, meaning that they were unsuccessful in what they tried to achieve. And these Tongva people were not being granted what they deserved and what they owned because basically it wasn't something they had to win it was their land and it was taken away from them this site is cyclical rather than linear because it thankfully it did not stay in the past today it is still recognized as this place being the Tongva village because if you go there and you visit the site you could actually see uh, how their tribe was and how everything was back in the day because the stuff remains there this site relates to both in the light of reverence and even the rain because in the light of reverence they they worshipped uh, their sacred land and walked around the rock and right here in the Tongva village you, when you actually visit the site you could see how everything was and you could tell that they worshipped their beliefs and their cultural and they lived their cultural ways of living and then even the rain uh, although they were these Indians were they were acting in the movie in reality they were acting the way they lived and their tribe and how what their cultural beliefs really were